In the harsh economic environment that followed World War I, the demand for combat aircraft diminished considerably. With more pressing peacetime requirements and a consequent slashing of military budgets, the RAF was cut back to a skeleton force. Despite this underinvestment in military aviation, progress was being made in the civil sector. A whole series of insurance records had been set, achievements that went lost on the Air Force planners. By the 1930s, it was realized that sizable aircraft had now the ability to cross national borders and bomb foreign cities. For the first time, civilians could be targeted. To deter a foreign bomber force, Britain needed to create its own. It was widely believed that against a massed bomber force, there was no effective defense. The ministry allocated the bulk of the air defense budget to the development of bombers. Consequently, fighter development was grossly underfunded and technological development lagged behind. The British fighter force of the early 30s was made up solely from biplanes. It was beginning to be realized that the biplane design had limitations. Wind tunnel tests revealed that the design was intrinsically drag creating. With struts, wires and fixed undercarriage, the potential for streamlining was limited. Despite this, hawkers, like most other aircraft manufacturers, were designing aircraft around the well-proven biplane concept. In 1924, Hawker Engineering employed Sidney Cam as their chief designer. One of his first projects was the Hawker Hart, a light bomber with a remarkable top speed of 184 miles an hour. In 1928, this was faster than the RAF fighters of the day. As a result, a fighter version was developed, the Hawker Demon, which came into service with the RAF in 1931. The next project was another fighter, the Hawker Fury. With a top speed of over 200 miles an hour, this represented the pinnacle of Hawker's biplane design. But by the mid-30s, when it came into service, it was already outmoded. In Germany, the Nazis were preparing for war. With tremendous resources being allocated to aircraft research and development, Hitler's designers were coming up with monoplane bombers, the performance of which threatened to exceed the then current RAF fighters. It was becoming more pressing that the RAF had faster aircraft. The fastest machines of the time were those developed for the Schneider Trophy air races. Britain held the Schneider Trophy with its Supermarine S6B. This state-of-the-art monoplane was capable of speeds in excess of 340 miles an hour, a remarkable achievement aided by the new streamlining techniques. Rolls-Royce had developed an engine with cylinders in line as opposed to the rotary engine with large drag-causing frontal area. A development of this R-series engine, the BV-12 or Merlin, would go on to power Britain's next generation of fighters. At Hawker Engineering, Sidney Cam, seen here on the left, realizing the RAF's new requirements, set about the design of a fast monoplane fighter. This would be built around the new PV-12 engine and for ease of production would utilize existing jigs and tools developed for Hawker Fury manufacture. The new aircraft was to be constructed from metal tubes supported by wooden formers and covered in fabric, producing a light but strong aircraft which would be rugged and easy to repair. The ministry would require an aircraft that could operate from a grass strip of a minimum length of 1,250 yards. Cam's aircraft would need a durable and forgiving undercarriage equipped with brakes. To reduce drag, this would have to be retractable. Cam's solution was to devise a wide track inward folding undercarriage where the wheels would be housed in the thickest part of the wing. This arrangement gave it stability on bumpy airfields. On November the 6th, 1935, K5083, the prototype Hurricane, made its first flight from Brooklyn's airfield. Now fitted with the new Rolls-Royce Merlin C, producing 1,030 horsepower, the aircraft had a top speed of 315 miles per hour at 16,000 feet. After extensive flight trials at the Aeroplane and Armament Establishment at Marplesham Heath, the aircraft was approved for production. Hawkers received an order for 600. L1547, the first aircraft off the production line, now officially known as the Hurricane, was delivered to the RAF in October 1937. 
the 16-month interval had been used productively to fine-tune the basic design. The aircraft now boasted eight Browning machine guns with four housed in each wing in two compact clusters. They were mounted just outside the arc of the propeller, giving it accurate and concentrated firepower. The guns selected for this purpose were the American-made and very reliable Colt Browning. Another advantage of this arrangement was that the guns could be adapted to take standard British Army rifle bullets. Each machine gun was supplied with 300 rounds, allowing 14 seconds of continuous fire. In its first year of service, the original two-bladed propeller was found to be inefficient and was soon replaced with the de Havilland three-bladed two-pitch propeller, an improvement which greatly increased the Hurricane's rate of climb. With international tension increasing, the emphasis was swinging from bomber development to fighter production. At last, Britain had a fighter which was a potent deterrent. On September the 1st, 1939, Nazi forces entered Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. Within 18 days, German blitzkrieg tactics had crushed Polish resistance. Next were Holland and Belgium. To try to counter this major offensive, the British Expeditionary Force, including four squadrons of Hurricanes, were sent to bolster the French defences. The French needed help with no less than seven German armies, consisting of one and a half million troops massing on their borders. By mid-May, the French and the British were fighting a rearguard action. Churchill, Britain's new Prime Minister and head of the new coalition government, was asked for more fighter reinforcements. In response, another four squadrons were dispatched. The Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command, Sir Hugh Dowding, had strong reservations about this decision. He urged Churchill not to fritter away the RAF's fighter force, which would be needed for the defence of Britain. On May the 19th, this advice was heeded. Churchill made the unpopular decision that no more fighters would be sent, however pressing the requirement. A few months before, the Hurricane had tasted its first blood. An aircraft from Number 1 Squadron, had shot down a Dornier 17 on October the 13th. This was to be the first enemy aircraft shot down by the RAF in World War II. As the weeks rolled by, Hurricane pilots claimed many more Dornier kills. It was clear that against German bombers, the Hurricane was a deadly opponent. The results of the Hurricane's first engagements with fighters, however, were less impressive. On December the 22nd, three Hurricanes patrolling the front line was set upon by German fighters diving from above and behind. The aircraft in question was the lethal Messerschmitt 109. The BF 109 was more than a match for the Hurricane. Armed with two cannons in the wings and two 7.9mm machine guns firing through the propeller with the aid of an interrupter gear, the two cannons not only had a greater range than the .303 machine guns in the Hurricane, but also had explosive shells which could penetrate armor plating. In addition, the Daimler-Benz engine was rated at 1175 horsepower, more powerful than the Merlin, giving it a higher top speed and a greater rate of climb. Together with this, the Daimler-Benz engine was fuel-injected, giving continuous power even in negative G maneuvers. Between May the 28th and June the 4th, 338,226 British, French and Belgian troops were evacuated from the beaches at Dunkirk. The Hurricane squadrons were rapidly withdrawn and forced to leave any valuable spares. So began the tense period of preparation before what was to become known as the Battle of Britain. Churchill said to the House of Commons, The Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. So bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour.